While our formal reports all relate to 2019, in these remarks, I want to bring things up to date. And who could have predicted at our last APCM 18 months ago what 2020 would bring? I recently heard this helpful piece of advice for the current time. Think long term, but plan short term. Think long term, but plan short term. And I want to use that as a kind of grid for reflecting on our life together in the last few months. I've never known a time like this when it was impossible to make firm plans for the future because everything keeps changing. And we've been told that we're likely to be in that place for at least another six months. Short term is the only way to go. But that doesn't mean that we should lose all sight of hope and vision for the future, especially in God's kingdom. So we keep thinking long term, even if we can only plan a few weeks or months ahead. What then of our vision of being a Christ-focused, community-facing church family. Well, our focus on Christ was seriously challenged with the beginning of lockdown in March. There's never been a time in history when all the churches in the land have had to close for four months. That alone tells us what extraordinary times these have been. However, neither has the technology to unite people in worship over multiple platforms ever been so readily available. Websites, YouTube, Facebook, Zoom and the good old telephone have all become alternative vehicles for worship. You may have heard some of the stats. Approximately a quarter of the adult population accessed some form of online worship during lockdown. Surprisingly, that was nearer a third in the 18 to 30 age bracket. Like us, most churches saw more people joining them online than ever used to attend in person. And some have seen dramatic growth, even if that has inevitably tailed off a bit since restrictions began to ease. Our own YouTube channel now has 60 videos on it, with a total of 11,000 views, and that's not at all unusual. We've now moved to a hybrid mode, with online services continuing alongside scaled back worship here in church. And we still have no idea when we'll be able to sing or hold larger gatherings, but the worship of God's people goes on. A bit like a river that simply finds another course when one becomes blocked. We are still a Christ-focused people. We've just had to do it more from our homes and use unfamiliar means. I find really encouraging signs for the long term in that. Even if you ask me what we're going to do at Christmas and I can't answer. Remaining community facing has been even more challenging. For the most part, we don't know who our additional viewers on YouTube are, though occasionally we hear stories of a family member or neighbor letting slip that they've been watching. The Saturday morning prayer space at Holy Trinity has also attracted a few new people, but perhaps the most striking opportunity of the last six months has been a greater willingness to stop and talk over the garden fence or on our permitted daily exercise back in April and May. As these restrictions continue, may God show us new opportunities to face towards our community. As with worship, our fellowship as, as a church family also had to find different ways to express itself. 
Virtual coffee after church was an immediate surprise success, with more than 60 households joining at one time or another. Zoom quizzes, cell groups and youth meetings soon followed, the latter achieving close to 100% attendance during lockdown. Again, we took every opportunity to stop and chat while out for a walk or gather in gardens once that was allowed. Phone calls, emails, notably the lowdown, lockdown lowdown, and all forms of electronic messaging helped us to keep in touch. Nevertheless, it was a lonely and remains a lonely time for many people and the, and the calling to care for one another in God's family is more important than ever. Having to be flexible and innovative has brought many new ways of doing things which bode well for the future. One leadership consultant says the church moved forwards 10 years in as many weeks in terms of its online ability and visibility. And it appears we'll have to continue thinking on our feet for some time to come. No chance of settling down just yet. So if anyone knows how we're going to do Christmas under present circumstances, I'd be very glad to hear. Answers on a postcard or an email, please. Well, moving on to other areas where we need to think long term, if we can only plan short term, the finance conversation is a particularly difficult one this year. With lockdown and now entering a recession, church finances have taken a hit at local, diocesan and national level. This may have serious repercussions for clergy numbers and deployment in future, leading to further pastoral reorganisation, the process by which parishes are grouped together under one vicar or incumbent. It's not all bad news though. In our diocese, the increase of homeworking is leading people to people relocating to the countryside, bringing new life into rural communities and churches. Most of the shortfall in our own income this year has been a result of loss of hiring charges from the church hall rooms and Trinity. However, congregational giving also has not risen as expected in recent years with many of us still giving at the same level we did 10 years ago. This is part of our Christian discipleship that we need to revisit and think seriously about if the mission and ministry of our churches is to go forward in these difficult times. We're fortunate to have been able to cover this year's shortfall from reserves, but that won't be a sustainable position in the future. I say this is a difficult message because while I need to challenge us all to look seriously at our regular giving, I also recognise that many still give sacrificially and others have gone over and above to contribute to the Church Development Fund. So a sincere thank you to God and to you needs to go side by side with the challenge to look at our giving. We're certainly in a much better position than many churches, thanks to that generosity. But we need to go even further. Mention of our Church Development Fund brings me to a happier topic. In all honesty, the reordering of St Thomas's, which is now largely complete, has exceeded all my expectations. I hope you agree this building is looking stunning with the new lighting emphasising the beauty of the roof structure and the colours of the new wooden floors, carpeted step and chairs. The new AV system works superbly and the greater flexibility of chairs has been a godsend in terms of social distancing. I always knew the changes were going to make the building easier to use. I just wasn't prepared for quite how good it looks. 
For 10 months, immediately before the current pandemic forced us to close our doors in March, St Thomas's congregation had been worshipping at Holy Trinity. That period also exceeded my expectations. There was a real buzz on Sunday mornings when we could worship and then share fellowship afterwards, all within that beautiful light and airy space. Whatever we'd previously thought about Holy Trinity, we all had cause to be grateful that God has given us not one, but two magnificent buildings to use for his kingdom. Saturday morning, Saturday coffee mornings and other events began to show how Trinity's prominent position in the centre of a roundabout can be used for mission. It may now seem as if all that has inexplicably been put on hold, but I believe that sojourn at Holy Trinity prepared us for this unprecedented period because we had to become adaptable and willing to change. Some things may have been temporarily paused, but in the long term, I believe we'll emerge with the right attitude to both buildings, a mixture of holding them lightly recognising more than ever that church is not about buildings, but also grateful for the opportunities they give us for mission and ministry. For over 10 years now, of course, Kingfisher Church has been reminding us that church is more than the building. That small congregation's commitment to Paxcroft and Castle Mead has been unswerving. It's been far from easy, but they've stayed faithful to God's call to bring friendship, hope and healing to that community. They've been sensing for some time that more resources and a new leadership structure were needed to fully realise that call. And we're beginning to see signs that God is meeting both those needs and moving in both areas. I confess it's been a challenge at times to hold all this together. Our commitment to all the Meads, Paxcroft Castle and Broad, two wonderful but costly church buildings and the spectrum of spirituality within our church family. But I believe we're richer for all of it. More importantly, I see us poised for effective mission and dare I say it, growth, as we enter the 2020s. We have a large harvest field and some excellent plant to hand on to the next generation. And if there is to be further pastoral reorganisation in the diocese, I don't think anyone could now argue we're not viable as a parish, as they tried to in the past. In seeking to lift our eyes from the immediate to the longer term, I've spoken a lot about the buildings, but of course our most precious resources are always human ones. Mobilising the whole church for ministry has always been the goal, and I'm glad that we've established a blend of paid staff and voluntary lay ministry. With clergy numbers decreasing, a few key salaried staff will always be essential, alongside others who are able to offer their gifts and time unpaid. We currently have three part-time paid ministry staff who have all had a crucial role during the COVID crisis. Alison Bennett, as Kingfisher team leader, has been the consistent keeper and articulator of the vision for Paxcroft and Castle Mead. Far from losing momentum during lockdown, Kingfisher Church have returned to worship at the Mead School with new people attending on Sundays and Ruth Barber working alongside Alison for a year as a voluntary ministry intern. I'm watching with anticipation what God is going to do there. In her paid role as church administrator, Ruth has built on the work of her predecessors and demonstrated that admin is a spiritual gift which releases those of us who are challenged in that area to do what we do best. Ruth blossomed even further in her role during lockdown 
when efficient, good-humoured communication was of the essence. And we share her excitement now as she explores the possibility of a call to ordained ministry, saying, yes, Lord, but not too soon. And thirdly, Beth, our youth worker, just gets better and better. Another natural community builder, she's grown our young people's groups in number and spiritual commitment to the point where approximately 15 older teenagers were regularly joining the apprentice Zoom meeting on Sunday mornings during lockdown. That crisis also saw Beth willingly step into a new unofficial role as our social media and IT facilitator, hosting virtual coffee after church every week, editing many of our YouTube services, and starting countless Zoom meetings from many different locations, her bedroom, mountain tops, and Toby Carveries. Whilst thanking our paid staff, I want to make it clear that those of you who are in a position to give your time and talents voluntarily make equally vital contributions to church life. Our preaching team of LLMs, retired clergy and others serve week by week across our three congregations and have continued to, continued to do so online during COVID. And all the rest of you, who only get the briefest mention for serving on committees and rotors, or leading a group, or helping out at a work party, or a, a hundred other ways. Thank you. You know who you are. In a recent sermon on the parable of the labourers in the vineyard, I suggested that God values all our work equally and doesn't make the same distinctions we often do. Now I want to honour two people who've made outstanding contributions to our parish life. I've already expressed my delight with St Thomas's reordering and both these people have been up to their necks in that, as well as the improvements at Holy Trinity to the stage, kitchen, meeting room, cupboards and now toilet doorway. Jamie Farnell has steered our development programme at St Thomas's and Trinity pretty much from its inception in January 2014 to where we are now, with huge skill, patience, attention to detail and grace. And if you comment on the hours of work and sacrifice he's put in, Jamie simply says, God asked me to do it. And the evidence that God did indeed call Jamie to this role is the quality of the results, the fact it all came in miraculously close to budget, and that God has now provided a major grant to cover the one piece of work we weren't able to complete, the baptistry roof repair. We're so glad God called Jamie, and we're so glad that he responded. And he would be the first to say that he's headed up a great team, both on the development and fundraising sides. And our sincere thanks go to all of them too. The other person I want to thank personally and on your behalf is Mandy Archer. Over 10 years ago, I went to see Mandy to try and persuade her to become church treasurer. Naively, I imagined that a soon-to-retire maths teacher would be ideal for the job. Mandy quickly informed me that she had no interest or knowledge of accounts. However, that conversation started a train of thought, and somewhere along the line, Mandy said she might think about standing as church warden. I now consider that one of the most fruitful home visits I ever made. Mandy has brought skill, energy and a can-do attitude combined with deep personal faith and love for people to the job of making sure our buildings are well cared for and our services run smoothly on both sides. Her ability to bounce back from disappointments and frustrations were very necessary as a major player 
on the church development team. Just like Jamie, Mandy has been God's chosen person to fulfill the role for the last nine and a half years, the extra half as a consequence of COVID. I like to think of it as a lap of honour. We'll be making a presentation to Mandy and Jamie at the APCM, but I want to put on record that I couldn't have asked for two better people to see us through phase one of our buildings programme. Our thanks go to both of them and their families for the sacrifice and service involved. Bishop Andrew said recently that we don't yet know whether the church has been going through a pruning or a judgment. I agree it's too soon to say with certainty what God is doing in all this, but I think there's a third possibility, that this is a sort of Sabbath, a pause in some of our frantic activity, which will allow spiritual fields to lie fallow in preparation for future fruitfulness. Pruning, judgment, or Sabbath, or maybe a bit of all three. Whichever it is, in the short term, let's continue to be a Christ-focused, community-facing church family. And in the longer term, with God, there's always the promise for new life and growth. Amen.